we think about the brain today as being one solitary organ where you can localize deficits for a variety of different disorders that some of which have traditionally been viewed as neurological, some of which have traditionally been viewed as psychiatric, but now those lines become blurred somewhat as we understand more about the biology, the neurobiology, the localization of the problem within the brain. So we used to think about depression in a relatively subjective way, where patients had to have a series of symptoms that collectively made the diagnosis. But what we've seen of late, meaning over the course of the last several years, up to about a decade, is a movement toward making diagnoses that are more biologically based. So thinking about biomarkers, taking measurements of certain chemicals or certain imaging findings and then determining whether or not that equals a diagnosis of depression. We think of depression as one solitary diagnosis, but in fact, what it may be are five or six or seven different diagnoses, uh, each of which may present clinically with depressed mood and impaired sleep patterns and decreased interest and apathy. But in reality, what's happening on a biological level may be different. So different parts of the brain may be associated with different types of depressive syndromes, and we may be able to parse out which types of syndromes correspond with which parts of the brain that are acting abnormally. By utilizing imaging and EEG findings or neurophysiologic findings, uh, plasma findings, you might be able to triangulate a diagnosis that is probably more sound and probably more accurate. If you think about the problem associated with diagnosing something erroneously, you end up implementing a treatment that is for a different type of diagnosis and then you wonder why patients aren't responding. And the the problem may be less that you're not, that the medications or the treatments are ineffective and, and probably more about making the wrong diagnosis. There are all sorts of biological elements to these disorders that are not strictly subjective, that are not simply how are you feeling. And by that I mean how are they sleeping? What's their appetite like? Has there been weight loss or weight gain? Do they have more or less energy during the day? Are they able to fall asleep and sleep throughout the night or do they wake up at four or five in the morning with constant worry and concern? So what we tend to do to get people talking a little bit about things that might be wrong in the context of a major depressive episode are, is to address these relatively biological questions. And when we get a series of responses that end up uh, being consistent with a diagnosis of depression, then we can reintroduce those facts, those data points to the patient and say, look, you're complaining of feeling sad and now there are a series of symptoms, a constellation of symptoms that uh, really argue for there being some kind of biological depression. We absolutely incorporate psychological theory into how we think about patients, but we, we do it so as to complement the biological theory and we're, we're much more interested in where the disease lives within the brain for a variety of reasons, one of which is the science supports it, the other of which is it informs our clinical process so that we can intervene more appropriately in terms of patient care. And then thirdly, you know, our view is that it allows for us to destigmatize some of these diagnoses. Unfortunately, in some circles, that people view uh, psychiatric patients as being damaged or as being weak uh, or the product of bad parenting. And as we learn more about the biology of the disorder, it, it's pretty clear that that's not the case and that we're talking about genetics, we're talking about uh, neurophysiologic function, and we're talking about brain hardwiring. The brain is a hardwired organ just like the heart is a hardwired organ. You have arrhythmias in the heart, you have arrhythmias in the brain. The brain manifests arrhythmias by way of behavioral uh, dysfunction or thought disorders or anxiety spectrum disorders or depressed mood and so it's more qualitative in its feel but when you come right down to it it's a hardwiring problem and in fact it does generate traction with patients people do respond better to the notion of this being a biological hardwiring problem that can respond to medication uh, versus some uh, very super complicated uh, uh, subjective experience. So what we say is that the biology may be necessary but not sufficient and in order to have the full-blown syndrome you need to first have the genetic loading, the biology, and then you need to encounter certain things in your psychological life or encounter certain things in your environment that set that process in motion that ultimately lead to the manifestation of the full-blown syndrome. The likelihood is that there'll be a combination of therapy that's brought to each individual patient. We like to think about it as a three-legged stool. One leg of the stool, which can't be compromised, is psychotherapy. There are two other legs of the stool that play equally uh, as important roles. For most patients, that means pharmacotherapy, it means medications. And we've made leaps and bounds of progress over the last 25 years in terms of what happens on a neurochemical level in the brain for people who are depressed. And we know that we can point to some usual suspects
of chemical messengers, things that travel between brain cells to help communicate appropriately. So what we do is we try to increase levels of those chemical messengers in the brain artificially by using antidepressants. And we've had a lot of success with those types of modalities. But a large majority of patients experience something in the way of side effects. And that could be weight gain, it could be sleep disturbance, it could be decreased libidos, all sorts of things that end up decreasing compliance and compromising the care of the underlying problem. So brain stimulation therapy is uh, a very popular area of research these days where you look both at non-invasive modalities and invasive modalities. So transcranial magnetic stimulation, which is a program we run here at Cornell, uses high-powered magnet therapy to generate electrical currents in very specific parts of the brain. So that's non-invasive. For the worst patients, the patients who have full-blown illness that isn't responsive to medications or psychotherapy, or other forms of non-invasive brain stimulation, we have something called deep brain stimulation, which is an invasive procedure where we implant electrodes deep inside the brain, again, in areas of the brain that we think are implicated in, the, in these disorders. And then we turn up or turn down the stimulation on those electrodes to get the kind of clinical result we're looking for. Rarely in medicine in general, irrespective of the subspecialty, are you able to see in real time evolution in terms of how patients get treated. Uh, and, and not a small movement of the needle, but a dramatic movement of the needle. And I think that's what we're seeing in neuropsychiatry. So it's a very exciting time to be in neuropsychiatry at New York Presbyterian Weill Cornell.